Right. Um, hello, everyone. Well, thanks for joining us for this uh, live session. Um, as you know, um, this month, February, is dedicated to technology. And again, it is a topic that is selected by our audience. So I hope you will be enjoying um, this uh, topic. So as part of this month, though, uh, we have got again a, a exciting list of activities, blogs and speakers lined up. And we will be exploring the wonders of technology from wearable devices to artificial intelligence with a range of uh, fantastic scientists who are contributing with different materials. So for those who are actually new to our material, our platform, I would like to provide information about the structure of our live Q&A sessions. So in the next half hour or so, our guest, Dr. Alex Kassen, will be answering our questions about his research, uh, through which he is aiming to understand all aspects of how electronics interface with biology and his particular interest is on wearable devices and personal health um, uh, monitoring uh, by using these. So after this though, after the first 20, 30 minutes, well, he will be answering our questions. We will have a 10 minute comfort break and we will resume back to get answers to your questions submitted to our social media accounts or through our YouTube channel using the chat uh, function. So please make sure you reach out to us within that 10 minute or while he's actually um, answering these questions, um, the initial questions that we have got within the first half hour. So uh, just a brief introduction about Alex. So Alex is a academic researcher who moved to Manchester in 2013 after completing his training in Oxford and Imperial College London. So Alex, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here with us today. And thank you for sparing your time to tell us about your research. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Right, so to start with, uh, would you be able to give us an overview of your research and uh, maybe give a brief introduction to yourself as well? Yeah. Um, so my background is in electronic engineering, and that's the department that I'm in now at the University of Manchester. Um, I've always looked at electronic engineering in the context of uh, wearable monitoring, healthcare monitoring, interfacing with biology. So it's not purely about kind of making computers, making computers faster, making them lower power. It's a, a big focus in terms of electronic engineering, but looking at, yeah, how would we, how do we make these things we now call wearables? How do we make them miniaturized so they, they need a very low power consumption so that the battery can be physically small? I started off doing that in my PhD. Um, looking at wearable brain monitoring for applications in epilepsy. And that's about kind of putting small electrodes on your head, measuring the signals that result outside of the head due to the operation of the brain inside and making that sort of technology more portable, more wearable. Today, um, we've worked, I've worked across a wide number of different uh, healthcare areas. So we've done a lot of work around autism, around chronic pain, um, some chronic kidney disease, uh, serious mental illness. And because there's lots and lots of different applications for wearable uh, type devices. On the kind of technical side, um, I try to split this down into kind of three themes within uh, my portfolio. So in, in my research team, we've got about 14 or so people, depending on, on how you count, um, looking at different aspects of how do we make wearables better? How do we make the next generation more functional? So part of that is looking at flexible electronics. So electronics that you can bend, that you can potentially stretch. And you know, if you've got to kind of curve this around your arm, you know, it can actually kind of curve with your body rather than sitting on top like a, a current device might do. Then we also look, the second theme is looking at how do we go beyond just monitoring? So sometimes we talk about current devices being a, a one-way street. So they kind of collect data, they pass it from you up to the cloud where it's kind of analyzed. 
And we want to start closing that loop, so taking the insights that we get from the data and passing them back to the person. And in the long term, this might be a kind of a closed loop wearable treatment type device. So it detects whether something has happened, it analyzes the data as it's collected, and then it takes some action as a result of that. And of course, a lot of the engineering there is about the signal processing that needs to go on to make sense of the data and do that in a very small amount of time. And then our third theme kind of picks up on that signal processing, but takes it into areas around artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, doing um, larger scale analyses of the data. And that then can then feed into uh, kind of data-driven care plans. And so kind of using the data that we analyze automatically and again, using it to kind of close the loop as it were, but at a, a, a longer time scale rather than giving it an intervention. It's kind of about making sure that data enters the kind of care pathway and is used to help people. Okay, great. Well, it, it is certainly something that is, I suppose, is being picked up and, you know, um, especially wearables, you know, you see a lot of people wearing Fitbits or, you know, um, similar stuff. I've been resisting it for a while, but in the end, I think I gave in and I got one for myself as well. Mm -hmm. So what I was wondering, though, um, so... For example, um, we know that they they can you know sense vitals. Um, I, I actually seen an app the other day um, which actually measures your blood pressure as well, literally using your phone, the camera. So how does it actually work? You know, how does these devices actually able to sense our vitals without being so specialized? You know, medically specialized for that purpose. What's the actual science behind this? Can you tell us a bit more detail on that? Um, so um, all of the different um, modalities that you, um, uh, you, you might be measuring um, will have a different technological basis um, behind them. So in, in terms of the kind of history of wearables, I think they start off very much with kind of activity tracker type things. Um, like the classical bit bits. Um, inside them, there's what's called an accelerometer. And what they have in there is um, a cantilever. So it's basically got a little kind of pole on a spring, but it's kind of um, hundreds of microns big. Um, and as you move about, it moves, it kind of wobbles, and you can detect that wobble. Um, if you've got um, an electronics background, it changes what's called the capacitance. Um, but we can, we can measure changes in capacitance very, very sensitively. And what we get out from that is a measure of the acceleration that the, the device has gone through. And so you, when you put this on somebody's body, every time you take a footstep, you get a, a great big kind of spike of acceleration. It, it might not feel that to you, but your whole body shakes a little bit, essentially. And so you can quite clearly see um, this kind of pattern of footsteps being, being taken. And then you can do some signal processing. You can make some algorithms to automatically count those. Um, and they can be more accurate or less accurate, depending on how much processing it is you want to do. Um, For some of the other modalities, so after um, kind of accelerometry, we get very much into the space of kind of heart monitoring. So this came first with the kind of light-based monitors. So these operate by signing a light into, into you and measuring how much is reflected back. And how much is reflected back changes with blood flow. So, and you've got kind of, you know, you can think of it as when you've got more blood um, in between, it, it's slowing down, um, kind of blocking the light coming back, you get kind of more absorption, so you get less being reflected. And then when you've got slightly less blood going, you get kind of more light coming back. And you get a kind of a pulsatile waveform that, um, that lets you measure heart rate. 
And that technology is broadly the same as as it had been used in hospitals, in a clinic, for a very long time. The challenge in terms of doing it in wearables was that actually that uh, measurement is very, very sensitive to interference, and particularly interference from motion. So you've got it on your wrist and you're waving it about. You don't see any of that heart-related information. What you see is the motion, the movement. <laughs> um, and so really the kind of innovation that enabled um, that sensing to be um, uh, to, to become mainstream was actually the accelerometers because we've got a measurement of the motion. And so uh, what you do is you make an algorithm that takes the kind of l- reflected light, your heart-related signal, which is contaminated by motion. You take a measurement of motion, and you subtract the two, and it leaves you with a few more steps. But it leaves you with the heart-related information, where you can then, um, yeah, measure your heart rate, measure your heart rate variability, um, that sort of thing. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. So. Um... Where do you see these wearables going though? You know, do you see this field being improved even further? You know, what's where do you see the maximum potential for these wearable watches, especially in healthcare? Yeah, so I, I don't I don't think we're in anywhere close to the kind of the peak use or kind of peak integration with the care system. Um, there was a uh, review done a couple of years ago now um, called the Topol Review. And I, I might get this number wrong off the top of my head, actually. But I think he was predicting that by about 2050, 80% of care pathways would be impacted by wearable technology. So 80% of the things that you might go and see your clinician for would involve some use of wearable technology to get kind of out of a clinic data to collect information on you before you arrive, you go in, maybe eliminating the need for you to um, go in. So um, that's a, you know, a very large number of care pathways, but equally we've got another 20 or 30 years <laughs> before that really kind of um, pans out as it were. And I think in the more immediate term, certainly from the kind of healthcare point of view, um, a, lot of the, 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 a lot of the work is about getting them into the care system. So a lot of wearables today would be kind of health and wellness devices. So they're kind of for information only, um, therefore kind of quantified self, your kind of personal monitoring. They're not certified as a medical device. And often those kind of standards that we have for medical devices are somewhat more stringent than for a health and wellness device. If you're gonna kind of take a decision that might affect whether somebody gets better, whether they don't. Um, you want to make sure you've got the very best kind of quality data. But then of course, so, so we're just kind of work on that front, but also just getting them into the care system. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we have electronic health records, but they don't necessarily match up with where wearables are sending their data. And there's all manner of kind of privacy and security things that need to be matched up to get a kind of a, a seamless system. Okay, okay, great. So you mentioned that these variables do actually are actually prone to noise, you know, uh, they're not actually very, you know, um, accurate. So how do you think we can increase the accuracy? Or do you think we can actually um, increase the accuracy so much that, you know, if we, if we can achieve that, what, where do you see what's the maximum that we can use them for, do you think? You know, obviously, yes, they can help to manage the patients. But, you know, how far do you think we can we can push that after sorting out the accuracy problems? Um, so I, I think the accuracy kind of uh, it varies, right? And, and there are some which are certainly very good. And sometimes there are choices that are made when you make them. Um, it's, it's sometimes you optimise them for one user group, which might mean they don't work particularly well in a different user group. Um, and of course, you can have different algorithms to tune the different different points in the uh, different points in time. Um, I mean, I think in, in in my head, it is about starting to what I would call close the loop. So it's not about just presenting lots of data to a clinician and saying, "Here, make use of this." 
Um, it's about um, enabling kind of changes in care based upon the data. So there's a concept known as, as um, circadian medicine. So we've all got a body clock um, mm. and it kind of changes over time as you age, depending on how much light you've had in particular, how much light exposure, different for different people, all, all of those sort of things. Um, but there's increasing evidence that, um, you know, for example, when you optimally take treatment X, depends on your body clock. You know, if you can align the delivery of that, um, to what's called somebody's chronotype. So we've got a concept of, of a genotype you know, from your, coming from your genes, but people would have a clock type. And if you can start to measure, not, just, not the raw physiological parameter, it's not about heart rate, it's about where is somebody within their natural circadian rhythm, then we can start to use data to optimise the care that somebody gets. And then there's extensions of that so then the kind of full closed loop would be um, not just kind of optimizing not saying we'll give you your treatment at 605 we'll give me my treatment at 610 but actually detecting yes event x has happened now we're going to do um, um, release drugs x or stimulation y or send you a message to check you're okay um, and for doing that kind of full closed loop type thing that's where you want the really high data quality. Um, if, there's, if there's nobody in the loop, as it were, to check it for you, um, making sure that you're uh, making the, the, the correct decisions. Okay, okay, thank you. So how do you see that, you know, obviously it's very interesting. You mentioned about, you know, closing the loop, or loop obviously, you know, giving them, um, medics enough information but you don't want to overwhelm them you also want to help them to actually interpret or know how to use that data so how do you see these variable variables going from uh, being used just for monitoring to um, closed loop monitoring and to treatment devices you know what kind of engineering do you think we're going to need for this? And do we actually have that right now, that technology, or is it still being developed? Uh, so I think it's still being developed is the short answer. Um, I mean, in terms of kind of getting these things into clinicians' hands, um, not, not the kind of closed loop type stuff, but this is happening already. There are lots of clinicians, um, certainly in the Manchester area, who are using wearables, um, certainly as part of, re of, of research projects, they're very keen to explore what can they do, um, what can't they do, where are they, they um, where are they, in what, in what cases are they, are they valid? Um, and, you know, that will grow. <laughs> um, particularly once, once clinicians have used them and gained confidence um, and um, all of those sort of things, it will create, a, create more user pool to um, bring, these, bring these things in. Um, now, what was the second part of your question? I, I didn't quite answer that. Okay, okay. So um, one of the other things that we obviously get with these devices, or whether it's your smartphone, you know, measuring what you're doing during the day, monitoring or, you know, monitoring your sleep patterns or, you know, heart rate, etc., or whether it's a Fitbit that you actually wear on your wrist. So obviously battery life is an issue when it comes to these things. So do you think there are any ways to improve the battery life of current devices? And if so, do you think these technologies will be safe, you know, if not cause any problems uh, for, you know, being, for being there all the time, for, ex you know, for ex having it exposed to, um, having our skins exposed to it? Do you think there will be any problems on that as well? Um, so... I think there's two slight questions in there. So one was about powering. Um, so battery improvements are coming. Um, historically, it can kind of takes between about five and 15 years for there to be a meaningful improvement in a, a, a given battery. So the really kind of increase in capacity in the same volume, as it were, is, is slow, but it is going in the, um, in the right direction a lot of research these days is about kind of flexible batteries and stretchable batteries again picking, fitting them into that um more comfortable sort of 
um, sort, of, sort of form factor. Um, within that, I think, I think a lot of the, um, we, a lot of the improvements in terms of power consumption haven't necessarily come from um, increasing the battery, but improving the electronics and decreasing their power consumption. Mm. And that's what we've really had huge, huge advances in over the last X many years. Mm. Um, I mean, in terms of wearables, they're in an interesting kind of space because often it's, the, it's not necessarily the electronics that really dominates. So particularly with those kind of optical heart rate measurements, so the ones that sign a light into you and measure the reflection, turning on a light consumes quite a lot of power. Um, and so that can be a really, doing the measurement that you want is a really big power drain compared to, say, um, having an accelerometer, which is very, which has a very, very low power requirement. So what there is certainly is then lots of research into um, well, both batteries, low power electronics, but then also the kind of holy grail, as it were, of energy harvesting. So being able to um, fully self-power devices. So there's been kind of kinetic watches available for quite a long time. They've got a little moving mass in them. So as you move around, it, the watch kind of winds itself up. Mm. Um, and they're, they're pretty robust. Um, you, a typical analog watt requires um, what's called what, about one microwatt of power. So mm. that's a millionth of one watt, um, or about kind of a hundred millionths of a typical old style light bulb. Um, by the time you get to a, a, a very, very optimistic looking wearable, you're probably at about a hundred microwatts <laughs> um, and probably a bit, a bit higher than most practical ones. So there is a big um a big gap there what we've done in a lot of my research we spend a long time looking at wearables placed at the feet kind of in smart shoe kind of things because um there's lots of evidence that you can harvest more energy lower down the body if you're doing something that was what we call piezoelectric so when you compress it you get a voltage kind of output obviously if you put your full weight on something at the bottom of your your body you can get, potentially get more energy coming out compared to um, something at the wrist. Um, in terms of kind of long, 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 long term sensing, um, you ask it against the skin. So actually, the um, there are standards for that kind of something called ISO ten nine nine three. Um, it doesn't for on skin use. It doesn't differentiate against um, how long you're doing it for. So it's kind of, um, they kind of separate out into transitory, brief and kind of long term. And the tests that you would do are exactly the same, regardless of which of those um, categories um, it, it is that you're, you're in. Certainly, there, there was, was a case a few years ago of kind of Fitbit. I think they changed some of their straps because there were, people were getting some reddening, um, uh, reddening around there. I mean, I think we're probably, I don't, I don't think we're necessarily talking about literally 24-7, seven days a week, <laughs> you know, 52 weeks a year um, kind of monitoring. Today, people need to take them off to charge them. We're still going to need to do that. And that's going to both charge the device and give, you know, your, your skin a chance to, to breathe and recover, that sort of thing. Okay, so that sort of, it, it is very interesting. And I was wondering, you know, is there a way of, you know, you get some of these um, sort of fancy watches uh, where, you know, as you move your arm, they just charge. Is it, do you think that technology can, can one day become part of these variables for, um, you know, that we use for monitoring health? You know, is, do you think there is always going to be a need for batteries or do you think the movement that is required to um, sort of keep a watch going can actually be used in the same way for these variables? So, um, I, I would never say never. Um, I, 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 I like to be an optimist. I think there's lots of scope for, for more research. I think kind of getting to that state, uh, that, that fully self-powered state at the wrist for something with a screen and a wireless transmitter 
mm. is going to be quite tough. Mm. Um, again, if you, as I said, we know in analog works, it works very well, but we just need an awful lot more power <laughs> to turn on a screen um, and a wireless transmitter. I think if you're selective um, in terms of what you are doing, and again, if you're willing to move the sensing to different parts of the body where there's maybe more power and whatnot, then yes, potentially. Um, I think there will always be some form of a battery in there, though. Mm -hmm. um, again, it depends a little bit on what it is you're trying to do. It might be that you're happy with opportunistic sensing. So if somebody moves, it powers itself, and then you capture that movement sort of thing. But um, assuming you want continuous sensing, you're going to need something just to um, cover you for the periods when uh, when you've been sitting in your, your chair for the last half an hour, like you've been doing. Um, and then you know, when we go for the comfort bake, we'll move around and charge it back up. But you need something to smooth the power between those, um, those different bits. Okay, all right, great. So um, one obviously other thing that I suppose people are wondering, so do you think the world of wearables will move into uh, implantable biotechnology? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and one which certainly I spend a lot of time um, kind of thinking about, and we're always um, looking for the, the next kind of thing, as it were. Um, so certainly, I mean, there are lots of implantables um, out there right now. Um, and, you know, surgery, for some of them is becoming um, much less invasive. I mean, implanting um, things around your heart is now a very minimally um, invasive uh, operation. It's, it's uh, there's not so much kind of open heart surgery um, as, there, as there used to be. Um, I think it's one of those, again, it, it depends on what it is you're, you're doing. If, if we're talking about kind of implanting a small tip in the arm, I think there's questions as to, is that what people actually want to do? But assuming it is, then that's probably quite credible. I think on the other hand, so, obviously, so we've done a lot of work in my lab about kind of brain monitoring. And... I don't, it's not really credible to um, see some of the implanted brain monitors replacing the non-invasive ones. Um, in that the implanted ones are much better. You'll get a much better signal, mm. but <laughs> it is brain surgery. <laughs> in, in the UK, we do about 200 of those a year, I think it is. And the costs, the impact on the person, the recovery, you know, we're just not, you know, we're not going to do millions and millions of those every year mm. um going to that kind of implanted so i don't i don't think it's it's not necessarily for technological reasons but it's, it's very very difficult to scale mm -hmm. um so we, i think we'll certainly see kind of pushing in that direction um but it's going to be about figuring out what's the best um sensing that people want to do um particularly in, in context of healthcare for their condition at its current state and that that state might change over time okay Great. And do you see, though, you know, for um, at the moment, I'm not too sure what are the uh, policies in terms of wearable technology, but do you see that something like that where, you know, instead of wearing your Fitbit, it will just get inserted under your um, skin or something, something like that will require a lot of uh, regulation and a lot of uh, policy because obviously uh, people might think that, um, that information or the fact that they've got the very um, wearables under their skin means that somebody is going to um, track them down or something like that, you know. In terms of regulation of all of these things, how do you see it happening? Do you really think that even if we have the technology, we are actually going to be at a position that I could just walk into a shop and get it put under my skin or is there going to be regulations on that? You know, how do you see this field actually moving forward in future? Yeah, so I, I think there's a few different areas where it kind of touches on that. So I think in terms of the kind of engineering and the kind of electronics, um, broadly, these sort of things would be um, a medical device, certainly if it's being implanted, um, in which case we've got the medical device regulations, the, the, the first ones coming into effect later this year. They're being changed again due to Brexit, but um, there's, there's very stringent regulation kind of already in place that would, I think, would broadly cover that. Now, that's then, I think, slightly different to the kind of privacy and security and kind of is this tracking me kind of questions. 
um, to which I, I, I'm not sure we necessarily have a clear answer to yet. Um, in that broadly, people are clearly very happy to do this. There are lots of people with whatever wearable device sending their data to whoever it was who made that device. Um, now, will public opinion evolve on that? Quite probably. And, you know, we've seen it evolve in the past on um, smoking, for example. Um, and, you know, we may well be saying kind of different things in X many years' time. I mean, I think certainly because the thing about implanted is that, um, you know, we can't mandate people to do this. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, people would always have to be opting to opt out. And of course, there's a question then of enabling people to make that personal decision for them of there are some benefits. Um, again, if it's a healthcare device, hopefully that's giving you some benefit. There are potentially some negatives um, with a their kind of real or people's opinions on, I'm happy for my legs to do this, I'm not happy for it to do that. Um, and what is the balance between those benefits and the, the risks? And if people are happy with it, then super. And if they're, if they're not, well, that's okay. We're, you know, we'll, we, we will have a range of um, yeah, non-invasive devices as an alternative, or indeed kind of treatments as we do today as an alternative, which might be less good. That's not quite the way of phrasing it. You know, it's, it's current, current standard practice, but um, it's, still, it's still available as an option if, if people want it. Okay, great, lovely. Well, I've been making you to talk for half an hour nonstop. So I think it's time to have a break now. And uh, during this time, please uh, keep submitting your questions. I have been sort of taking a note of the questions that has been submitted to YouTube. So please carry on doing that through social media or through YouTube. And we will resume at 10 past uh, seven to continue our discussion. Thanks very much, Alex. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Alex. Hi. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay lovely. So, still questions are coming through. All right, fantastic. So, it is really good that we have got questions coming from all of the uh, social media platforms. And I'm going to start with the one that was sent through um, our email uh, mailing list by our audience before we actually hosted this session. So that's the one that I would like to start with. Yeah. So, um, so the audience is asking, is it possible to have practical and affordable sensors linked to devices in new and existing vehicles, which would prevent them being driven by drivers who have consumed drugs or high amounts of alcohol? Um, so I think the short answer to that is yes. Um, certainly, I know that the car industry has done a lot of work um, around um, drowsiness detection. Um, so not kind of drugs and alcohol, as you were referring to, but um, detecting um, whether um, people are sleepy in need of a rest potentially um, in France of course the kind of law requires you to have a breathalyzer type device um, in your car although I don't believe any of them are linked up to the car to kind of automatically turn it off um, I mean, doing that link is technologically relatively straightforward um, what's not straightforward is of course mitigating for, well, if somebody else blows into it <laughs> um, um, and then you drive, um, you, need, you need a whole you know, second level of, kind of authentication there. Um, or again, the, the debate as to, you know, is that a, um, an, an acceptable thing to do? Uh, and, and of course, in, in terms of having your car automatically disabled, and of course, that probably needs to be done at the kind of industry level, because of course, you can imagine being concerned that people might buy one car rather than another if they seem to be not given control over the thing they've just spent 10, 20, however many thousand pounds um, on. Um, I, I'm more familiar with that, as I say, in terms of the drowsiness detection um, type, type thing. 
Mm-hmm. And then the big challenge is one of what do you do about it? <laughs> mm-hmm. in, in that if someone's driving along at two o'clock in the morning, you probably don't need to do anything clever to realise that they're probably drowsy. But getting the car to automatically stop safely, um, getting it to um, kind of go into a safe kind of failure mode, as it were, is much yeah. more difficult than some of the kind of detection type steps. Yeah. So I'm having some problems with the um, screen. So if you just give me a second to sort this out, that would be great. Yeah. Okay. Let's see what happens now. Right, there we go. Let's try again. Why are we having this like that? Right, so I think I think we're okay now. Okay, great. So uh, the other thing that I was wondering though, um, right. So um, the other thing that I was wondering, um, so you talked about using these wearable devices um, in autism. Yeah. So can you tell us a bit more about, you know, obviously as a um, initiative, we are very interested in autism. So can you tell us a bit more about how you're actually helping autistic people with these uh, variable technologies? How is it being used? So the work that I was speaking about there was looking at adult diagnosis, autism. Um, so most people with autism are kind of diagnosed when they're a child, um, but there's a, a significant subset who are diagnosed as adults. And of course, there's all manner of complexities um, around that, because often people, by the time they're an adult, they've come up with all manner of compensation um, schemes, kind of hiding type schemes. Um, often, um, and, and yeah, and so on. So what we were looking at were the kind of kinematics of um, of uh, adult movements in autism. So we were giving people relatively simple tasks, things like kind of pointing your, moving your finger in a pattern like this, um, and then using machine learning to um, identify, um, yeah, people coming from an autistic group versus people coming from a non-autistic um, autistic group. And one of the key things we were looking at there was explainability in the AI. So there's a lot of work at the moment about kind of transparent machine learning, um, something which, can't, which, which goes beyond just saying, I think you have autism. Something which can say, based upon looking at this bit of the data, you know, it went um, like this, and that's why I think, um, so I'm adding that layer of explainability. Okay, okay, great. So um, I would like to continue with audience questions. So do you think in the future um, we can treat multiple diseases using the same chip? Uh, same chip? So obviously um, I suppose they're suggesting that all the wearables will be inserted um, into the body or into an organ or um, under the skin and um, do you think that that's actually um, biologically or technologically possible yeah. so okay so I'm not sure I would interpret that question quite the same way so, so I think from the electronic point of view yes <laughs> so the kind of one of the big things that has enabled miniaturization and lower power consumption is taking everything that used to be discrete electronics and putting it onto one microchip. So that's known as a system on a chip. Um, and of course our systems on a chip are getting bigger and more functional. You know, they, um, they can have now both, you know, the front end for measuring um, heart rate from the ECG and heart rate from a PPG, um, from the optical method. And you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, they may have been two discrete chips. Um, but you can now kind of bring them together. And that's partly enabled by miniaturization of the microchips themselves, so they don't just get bigger and bigger. But partly, of course, better electronic design, because sometimes these things um, interfere with one another. 
and you need to be able to isolate them so you get a good quality, um, quality signal. Now, in terms of multiple conditions, um, now that's very interesting, I think, to, certainly to me in, in the context of wearables, because I think we're still very much in the technology push kind of phase. So what we can measure um, very well these days is things like activity, things like heart rates um, coming from that. And so what we're seeing is a lot of, certainly in the academic space, a lot of papers using heart rates and accelerometry in diabetes, heart rates and accelerometry in kidney disease, in whatever. <laughs> and it's because those are what we can measure. And I think as these things become more mature, we will switch to the more um, in diabetes, the key things to measure are ABC. And so that's what we, um, and that's what we're, um, and so that's what we have in this particular wearable. I mean, at, at the moment, the wearable that you get is essentially conditioned agnostic. You know, you measure exactly the same things. Now, there is a really interesting emerging area, um, particularly when you get to the treatment side, on what's called bioelectronic medicine. Um, and what this is trying to do is rather than to give you, say, a drug uh, or some, you know, some physical medicine when um, you need to take it, it looks at stimulating the nervous system. Okay. Um, and because there's various kind of implanted forms of doing this. Because the key is that the nervous system goes everywhere. Um, so all of your major, major organs, of course, are connected to nerves. And actually by interacting with that nervous system, we can get reach to parts of the bodies quite specifically, <laughs> um, yeah. which you can't necessarily do if you're just taking, say, an oral medicine. Um, so I think there's some, in terms of one tip targeting everything, I think there's some really interesting opportunities um, along those kind of bioelectronic medicine lines. Okay, all right, thank you. So, um, and again, we have got another question from one of uh, our social platform media platforms. And I think it's time to ask this question because you talked about diabetes there. So the audience is asking, if you were, for example, a diabetic, and could have a variable device for measuring insulin. Could this be linked to a device that pumped in insulin when required? Um, so the short answer is yes. So there are quite a few works around what's called the artificial pancreas. Mm. Um, and um, some of those are quite advanced stages. So I know certainly at, at Cambridge, I think they've done the main kind of trials in the UK. I know Imperial's done a lot of work um, as well. Um, but working towards doing exactly that sort of um, exactly that sort of thing. Um, and there's also it, it was also kind of lots of work around um, the sensing for that at all different sort of levels of invasiveness. So some just kind of skin patches, some going inside the body. I think the key, um, and I, I, don't, I don't think it's kind of, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not so, this isn't quite my area. I, I don't think they're quite at this, the, the, the wide rollout stage of that yet, but they're certainly at the very kind of advanced testing type stages. What they're not doing though, um, as far as I'm aware, is measuring insulin. I mean, measuring insulin kind of in the wild with all of the artifacts you get from people moving around kind of, um, the, the device itself moving, um, so on and so forth, the sensitivity levels that you need being very low, makes insulin measuring very, very tough. Mm. So I think um, those artificial pancreases are based upon measuring glucose. Mm. Um, and there's lots of work out there measuring glucose. You, may, um, you might remember the Google smart contact lens, which had a glucose monitor in there. Um, and so I think... Uh, and, and so, yeah, the scope for the next step, as it were, <laughs> to move from glucose sensing to insulin sensing. But I think that is a very technologically tough step. OK, OK. All right. Um, so we have got one more question from the audience. So what's the biggest challenge, in your opinion, based on your research or your experiences in the wearables world currently? And what do you think would be the game changer next move? Yeah. So, 
so we in, certainly in my team we spend a lot of time speaking to clinicians to kind of doctors and nurses um for that kind of, kind of real medical use type stuff and the the bits that come up time and time again there are battery life and these things just fall off <laughs> um let's let's say some of the sap ones so i'm talking about some of those kind of stick on pats um type ones um and so it's not necessarily um very kind of sexy work as it were but better adhesives um better things for kind of sticking things onto the body for a long time um particularly of course because the better the adhesive the larger the, the device can be the bigger battery you can have in there for example um without it um coming off and then um and then and then power consumption and there's lots and lots of things that we can do still to um uh reduce, reduce power consumption um i think in terms of research sometimes it's difficult to enable those it'd be really nice to be able to make our own custom chips um but it's it, sometimes it's quite difficult to get funding for that so we have to rely on using other chips and kind of connecting them together mm -hmm. i mean in terms of the um the game chains or the, the step chains as it were um i'm not necessarily I, I, I think i think from the so let me ask that Steve, from the technological point of view I think that these flexible devices, um, sometimes we call them kind of temporary to two type devices, um, you know, are a real step beyond what we have at the moment. You know, they don't look like a watt that's a bit smaller. Um, sometimes I've got a, a graphic which you know, shows in the 1980s, we had kind of desktop computers. I and mean, in the 90s, we had laptops. Mm. And in the 20... Um, uh, in, the, in the early 2000s, the noughties, we had smartphones. And these things are getting, you know, there's a step change in miniaturization every time. 2010s, it's a smartwatch. And in the 2020s, we only just have to start at that, but it really is these stretchable, flexible devices. You know, it's a step change in the miniaturization of what we can do. Mm. Um, but I think from the kind of deployment kind of side, it probably to me is more about building familiarity building clinical use cases, um, building desire for, um, you know, building user pool. And by, by user, I, I mainly mean kind of clinician in this, in this context. Um, and then overcoming these, where is the data going? Um, questions, you know, is it going to sit on a private company server? And then your health record, the NHS can access bits of that. Does it go directly into the NHS? Does it sit with you and the kind of your clinician has to reach out to you? Yeah. You know, there's different models there. Um, and lots of people actually, you know, kind of working on what would such an infrastructure look like. Um, but when we've got that sort of infrastructure, as I think we, I mean, I think that I mentioned the kind of top hole review and 80% of um, care pathways. I think that is realistic. Um, it's, but it's, it's a, a long road between here and 2040. Okay, great. Lovely. Well, thank you very much. Um, it has been really uh, an interesting uh, talk and it's really um, also good to um, know about the developments in this field. And I'm hoping that, you know, it will uh, keep developing further and ha help us, not only researchers, but also medics to actually um, overcome some of the health burdens that are sort of affecting our communities. And, um, you know, thanks uh, very much. You know, it was really nice. And currently feedback is coming through on Facebook channel. You know, people are thanking you for your wonderful Q&A session. So thanks very much for your time, Alex. And um, I would like to thank everyone who has joined us this evening. So please remember, we have got our live talk next week on Tuesday, same time. And speak to you then. And uh, while I have the opportunity, I also would like to uh, start advertising our anniversary events which is going to happen in April so please keep your eyes open watch this space we will be sending some uh, information out uh, for this uh, very soon so thanks very much for your interest and thanks for your time Alex yeah thank you very much <laughs>